It is an absolute delight to interview Howard Martin, Executive Vice President of HeartMath Institute today. Howard, you also co-authored the HeartMath Solution. You travel the world as a spokesman for HeartMath. Mm -hmm. I just saw you run a workshop for Peace One Day this weekend, and I was blown away by what you said. Mm -hmm. So I want to start by asking, what's the cutting edge stuff you're working on at HeartMath right now? Ah, the cutting edge stuff. Uh, well, we're always refining through understanding through science and certainly the work that our research team is continuing to do around social and global coherence. You know, what happens in groups of people? How do you bring about more harmony within groups of people and what's measurable in that context that can be used to engender more harmony and more cooperation amongst people? And then sort of looking at the big picture, how does that play out on the global stage of global coherence? And what are the interactions taking place between us as human beings and the energetic fields of the earth itself? All that's really cool and it's really interesting. And I think what's important about that research, however, is um, it paints a picture of that we're not alone. You know, it paints a picture of the connectivity that really does exist between all of us, even though we feel the separation and the divides amongst people. It really points towards the fact that, yeah, that's true at some level, but at other levels, we're really all connected. And then I think, too, for us, um, always looking to refine the tools and techniques and methods that we can offer people. Uh, that can get them to a place of connection to their own heart's intelligence so that they can co-create more meaningful lives for themselves. And in doing so, individually, it creates more social coherence, which leads to global coherence. So the theme's the same. I think what's new for heart math is a refinement and all that. And of course, we're always working on new technology and new training programs and all those type of things. But at the end of the day, it's still the same mission we've always had to help create a heart-connected world. So you're also on the steering committee, right, for the Global Coherence Initiative. Can you go into detail about that? Yeah, well, you know, the years ago we recognized we've been working from the bottom up a lot. We built heart math from the ground up. We wanted it to have mainstream appeal. So we didn't start with a wide concepts. We started with things that people could do and, and build from there. But the whole mission was based upon our own spiritual involvement. And so we made a choice about eight or nine years ago to, to actually start to work or release information working from the top down. Now, there are many groups all around the planet that have come together to use their, their heart or care, their intention or whatever to create positive change in society. And we decided we would begin to do more of that overtly as well. The Global Coherence Initiative was started to bring people together from all around the world to use their heart focus, their care, and their intention uh, to focus on various planetary needs, to ease some of the, the human suffering, for example, that's going on in the world today. Now, as I mentioned, there are many groups that are doing something similar, and part of our approach to this was not an ambitious one. We didn't want to try to be the biggest thing or the biggest deal in town or any of that. We just wanted to do our part in that regard, and it worked, and we have people that are part of Global Coherence Initiative from all around the world, hundreds of, you know, hundred and some countries. You can just go to the heartmath.org website and, and become a member of this. Because it's heartmath, uh, we wanted to bring some other aspects of that to the party, so to speak, and that's science. So we wanted to do some really interesting science to understand, if we could, uh, the interactions that are taking place between us as human beings, individually and collectively, and the energetic fields produced by the Earth. Now, for anyone watching, the Earth does produce energetic fields. There are a couple, uh, one's called the geomagnetic field. Many people have heard of that. It's what a compass measures, you know, for example. And it's a, a protective field uh, around our Earth, and it works in consort with another field called the ionosphere. These two fields together provide a protective layer around the planet. And they're important because if they weren't there, uh, nothing that we would uh, call life would be here. It would be a rock. Because these fields protect us from incoming, I'll generically call it space weather, solar radiation, solar winds, cosmic rays, you know, this type of, uh, of influences. So the fields are there to protect us from that. Now, where it gets interesting is that lots of research has been done showing that changes occurring in these fields, and they're always modulating. Those changes are affecting, directly affecting human health and behavior. At an individual level, it's been tied to all kinds of health conditions, whether it's heart attacks or strokes and various things. At a societal level, uh, changes in the fields are correlated to increases in crime or traffic accidents and all of that. So a lot of what's been reported has been about, you know, the negative effects maybe these fields are having on us. But there's another side of this whole thing. Changes in these fields have also been correlated to some of the greatest flourishings in human history. 
of art and literature and music and all these wonderful things. And so the effect the fields are having, in a sense, is very neutral. Uh, it's our response to that effect that determines you know, how that plays out. So we know the fields affect us. Now, using some good old Southern boy logic, we began to wonder, you know, if they're affecting us, could we be affecting them? And so we have a hypothesis that mass human emotion of the seven plus billion of us that are here on this planet, mass human emotion uh, has an impact upon the Earth's fields, whether positive or negative. Now, that's a hypothesis. And keep in mind, a hypothesis is something that has to be proven to be true or untrue. And so you have to do rigorous scientific research from a very neutral perspective to see if that hypothesis checks out. The hypothesis we have is, and again, is, is a two-way conversation going on. Between us as human beings, we all produce a field, and the seven billion of us, could our fields be affecting these much larger fields the Earth produces? So part of the Global Coherence Initiative is the science aspect of it. To test this hypothesis, uh, we have developed very sensitive technology that measures the subtle changes occurring in the geomagnetic and ionospheric fields. We're placing global coherence monitoring sites around the planet that are feeding information back to our research labs in Northern California 24-7. And scientists are analyzing that information, looking at the changes occurring in the fields and beginning to look at correlations between societal or planetary events and changes they're seeing through the global coherence monitoring system. There's a lot of work to be done. This is very complex science. Uh, there are a lot of things that influence the fields. The sun is the primary influencer. How do we distinguish human emotion from what the sun is doing? How do we filter that out? How do we begin to accumulate enough data to understand uh, the potential effects that we are having on the fields? Now, why is this even important? Well, if the fields are affecting us, what if we can affect the fields in a way that have a positive effect on us? <laughs> in other words, people, influencing the fields, the fields then influencing the people to engender more of the type of qualities I think we all want in our world today. So it's a grand experiment in many ways that we've undertaken uh, and there's more to come. So it's, it's fun to be a part of something like that. There are a lot of cool people that are associated with Global Coherence Initiative and uh, it's advanced research to understand ourselves, our world and the potential that we have to co-create a new and very different world. Beautiful. Long answer to your question. Oh man, no, I love it. Go on, because I can't get enough of this stuff. I want to know more about the science of emotion. If we go into that aspect individually, and then I want to bring it back to the collective. But you talked a lot in your workshop about how our emotions affect, you know, obviously our own field, mm -hmm. each other, etc. Yeah, let's talk about it first of all from the field perspective. Um, one of the things many people don't know is that the heart produces an, a magnetic field. You see, our heart's an electrical organ. When we go to a doctor and they take our electrocardiogram, electro should be a hint there. They're measuring electricity produced by the heart. The heart produces enough electricity that does create a magnetic field that surrounds us in 360 degrees but extends beyond our skin about three, fat, three feet out into space. And that's the most conservative measurement. That's measured with magnetometers, which are which is used to measure magnetic fields. Magnetic fields are imprinted with information. They exchange information. Uh, a good analogy is your cell phone. The cell phone produces a magnetic field that communicates with a tower, which then sends that information to someone else's phone that has a magnetic field. So the magnetic fields are exchanging information. You're imprinting the phone's magnetic field with your phone call, with your text, with your picture, or whatever that is, right? And so you're using that magnetic field to communicate. The heart's field is doing the same thing. Now, where does this tie into emotion? Emotions are imprinted in the heart's magnetic field. For example, if we're feeling angry, frustrated, irritated, those type of emotions, it creates a very incoherent spectra, it's called, in the field. There are a lot of incoherence in the frequency pattern that's produced by the field. Conversely, if we are experiencing emotions long associated with the concept of heart, like more care, more love, more compassion, kindness, non-judgment, that field changes. We're imprinting the field with different information. So fields do exchange information. So the science we're involved in today is understanding that exchange of information. You know, how is my field affecting your field right now? You know, uh, if we expand our understanding of the fields and take it beyond just the conservative measurement that we use now and take it into something like, let's say, quantum physics, which removes some of the barriers of time and space, then 
is the feel that I'm producing right now having an effect on someone who's viewing this film right now, whenever that is, however far in the future that is, uh, are all the people that watch this film and having a shared experience, creating some sort of common field uh, that exists as they all experience uh, your movie. Uh, these are questions that are yet to be answered, but this is where it gets to be really exciting research because now we're looking at the lens uh, of heart and emotion and all that through physics, not just physiology. Emotions do impact physiology, and it's important to understand that. I mean, uh, the emotional diet that we eat, so to speak, the emotions that we allow to run through our system are, in fact, triggering hormones in our body of all different kinds. You know, and they have a big influence over our health and over aging and a lot of different things. It's kind of well known now that strong negative emotions are detrimental to our physical body. They cause chaos in the nervous system. They cause a release of hormones in our body that we don't want too many of, like too, too much cortisol, too much adrenaline. Uh, it's also known now through our research and, and the research of others that when we're experiencing more regenerative uplifting emotions, like let's say more appreciation or more care, that what happens is, is the body produces more hormones that are regenerative, like more DHEA or, or more oxytocin. So there's a hormonal influence that happens physiologically in the body. There's an energetic influence that we create with our emotions through what we're broadcasting through the field. And then we tie that into understanding the collective field produced by humanity itself and all the different feelings that people are having in any given time. And it can begin to see how influential that is over how the world functions, how decisions are made, how governments functions, how society in general functions. It could be uh, tied directly to what's being imprinted emotionally through the fields that we produce individually as well as collectively. That is fascinating. That's where I really get into it. And that's actually what really catalyzed mm -hmm. my um, idea mm -hmm. to do this film. Sure. My desire, I found it so motivating. I love the words you use. You talk about emotional diet. You also talk about emotional palate. I do bring in the arts yeah. in this film as well. One of the things to understand about emotions is they're a great gift. Now, they're not often perceived that way, but the great gift of emotion makes us so unique as, as, as a human being. We feel more than any living thing on this planet. We feel this myriad of emotions, everything from extreme bliss to deep depression and thousands of different textures in between. I look at those emotions that we can experience like colors on an artist's palette. And we are, we are responding emotionally, yes, to external events. We're also choosing emotional responses. And the emotions that we have and that we're choosing to have are like the colors we're painting the picture of our life with. We can paint that picture if we want to because we have emotional choice, we can paint it with blacks and browns and grays, and the picture that we, of our life will be black and brown and gray. We can also paint it with color. We can also choose a variety of colors and textures that we can paint our life with through the emotional choices that we make. So it's just an analogy, but it relates to emotional choice. One of the things that gets lost in understanding emotions is that emotions aren't just reactions. We actually have emotional choices. We make them all the time about what we want to feel. And through using our awareness and our consciousness to make better emotional choices, we can really create our life and the whole entire experience of life. Uh, life will treat us differently when we are extending more of these type of uh, emotional qualities that we know are uplifting. You know, when we put that out into the life, into the world, people, situations, life itself responds differently. We're painting a different picture with those colors. Unfortunately, emotions are sometimes seen as the bad guy. You know, uh, I have all these emotions. I don't want to feel my emotions. Emotions hurt me. And, and, and people identify with the emotional sort of turmoil that they experienced in their life. So part of my message to people is that, yeah, that happens. and happens to all of us as part of being a human. It's part of the life experience. At the same time, think about all the uplifting, magnificent, beautiful emotional qualities that you have or that could have experienced in your life. And begin to focus more on the gift of emotion rather than the curse of emotion. I think within the context of that, we gain an awful lot in how we, uh, how we shape ourselves as human beings. That's the crux, isn't it? That's the, totally the bit that trips me up. Is, you know, I'm angry or I'm really sad about something. How do I transform that mm. into the higher emotions without suppressing it? You know, where's that fine line? Well, the transformer of emotion is heart. It's the actual intelligence of the heart that can do that. Uh, Hart Math and, and Howard Martin were not about uh, suppressing or repressing emotions. 
you want to observe your emotions. You really want to feel them and understand them. So it's the, actually the opposite of that. You're observing what you're feeling. You're not repressing emotions. But when you observe that you're feeling something that you know is not taking you in the right direction, that's not good for you, uh, as soon as you can, you try to shift that. And the way you shift it is through the intelligence of the heart. Let the power and intelligence of your heart make an emotional transfer. You see, emotion is really a neutral energy. It's energy in motion, emotion. It's what we do with that energy, what we assign it to that determines the emotion that it becomes, right? So we have this emotional energy and we determine that it's going to be frustration. We can then make a choice if we want to, and we can begin to shift that. It takes a little practice, but we can learn to shift that from frustration to peace, <laughs> you know, and shift it out of the emotion that's draining us to the emotion that's renewing us. This is a skill set it's, that people have now, and it's becoming uh, more readily available to people, even though it can seem that it's not. It's part of the new human, is the ability to utilize the gift of emotion in a different way. I totally want to go there, the new human and the fourth dimension stuff. I'm not quite done with negative emotions sure. yet. Okay. My story was quite extreme. I nearly died of acute alcoholism. Mm -hmm. um, really, the extreme escape of my emotions was the yeah. ultimate culprit. Yeah. And I guess that really sparked my obsession with understanding what our emotions are, what it means to be able to feel. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a very glamorous topic. It can feel... You know, I think you said on, in your workshop, it's not very sexy, really, emotions sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, how is it that we promote this message to those who are suffering and might not even know it? Well, first of all, I think that your story is important and it should be told um, because you move from this place to a new place. And I would never suspect that you'd ever been there, right? It doesn't show in you, it doesn't show in your being, it doesn't show in anything that you have. It's almost like you're talking about another person, right? And yet you have carried that in your life and you made that transformation. Give yourself a lot of credit for that. That is something that you need to honor yourself for and never, ever forget. Because it's not only a gift to you, it's a gift to the world that you pull that off. Most people don't. Most people can't. You did. But what that shows, too, is that if you did, others can Right. You know that it is possible for that to happen. No matter where we find ourselves in life, there's always some place we can get to that's much better. And that can truly happen for people. And I think the, the message is, is that uh, no matter how tough life is at times, and I know that people going through tremendous suffering out there, that there's always hope in that that there things can be different not to lose the hope not to fall into resignation not to fall into the place where you see no other option or no other hope because yeah there are tough tough situations out there and i'm aware of them but i also see the resilient of the human spirit come into life in so many different ways and those people become my heroes you know um i know lots of people that are that are important and or interesting or famous or successful and i love those people uh, there's also people that I run into that become real heroes to me, like the, the single mother with three children who's struggling to make a living and she's working two jobs. And yet she does her job with an upbeat quality to it and a smile on her face, looking out for whatever she's doing, taking care of the other people she's interacting with and walking in the world in a state that has a lot more peace and a lot more appreciation for life than many people have. And yet she carries that other heavy load. Wow. You know what I mean? Those are my heroes. That's who, who, who the heroes to me are, is people that do that sort of thing. So there's a, a resilience in the human spirit that can't be denied, no matter how tough life gets. And that's a message that I think people need to know. Hope is cool, but hope is kind of like hors d'oeuvres at a party. You know, they taste good for a while, but after you eat hors d'oeuvres for a while, pretty soon you want the meal, right? But hope can spark moving towards the meal, recognizing that there's a much better and different life waiting for every single one of us. That's a beautiful message. Thank you. Sure. Um, this emotional contagion, obviously you spoke about the science behind that in the field. Mm -hmm. You also spoke about the creational capacities that emotion has. Yeah. Could you go into that a little bit more? Well, I think we were, we're co-creators, you know, and I think that we're living in an era of heightened, what I call co-creativity. Um, you know, there's this field of information that's generally called consciousness. I mean, consciousness is hard to describe or define. Look it up in the dictionary. You won't even get a good definition of it. So I just casualize it and say that, you know, um, it's a, an infinite field of information that we are drawing from 
through the sensory apparatus that we've been given as human beings. And we're taking that information and we're constructing it into our reality. That's our individual reality, which is the perceptions we see about life and about various things. And then there's the shared realities, the big realities, you know, that we have that are, you know, or realities that everybody has. But within the context of all that, we are drawing from this field and we are using that information to determine the reality that we want. In other words, we are imprinting that field and the field's reflecting back to us. Now, my belief is, is that uh, it's not the thoughts that we have that are imprinting the field. It's the true deeper feelings that come from our core, from our heart. That we're, whatever is in our heart is being sent to the field. The field is reflecting that back. So it isn't the personality. It isn't the surface stuff. It isn't who we think we are or who we've been told we are. It's the deeper who we are that's really imprinting that field. As we learn and respect that, you know, we, we learn to recognize and ask the question of ourselves from time to time, what am I feeding the field? You know, what am I putting into the field and what's that attracting back to me? You know, so it isn't like hand in glove, like you put something great into the field you love or you, you, you care and all of a sudden you get a reward. But in the overall picture of things, life begins to shape itself differently. And over time, a new life and a new life experience and a new picture of life begins to emerge. So it's that co-creation that we have. Now, I think many people are becoming more aware of that because it's in the air right now. It's the recognition and honorment. That, hey, guess what? You know, I'm creating a lot of the situations in my life. I didn't realize it before, but I realize it now. As I move through my own growth, I begin to see that more clearly. And there's more to go for me, for sure. But I begin to see how much of what I am doing is creating what I'm getting back from life. And it's it puts me in two places when I find that, when I sense that. One is... Uh, wow, this is great, I'm co-creating, and I have the ability to co-create, which is one way of looking at it. The other is it can uh, put me in a position of recognition of um, responsibility. I'm self-responsible, you know, for what happens to me. And that moves me past things, uh, or further past things like blame and judgment and all that, to recognize that I pay, play a part in all of this, whatever feedback I'm getting from life that I, in some way, contributed to that feedback, you know whether it be positive, whether it be not so pleasant, whatever. So the co-creation thing's in the air right now. And it goes back again to my life's work, which is heart. I mean, we, when you develop the qualities of the heart, when you access more of the intuitive intelligence that is associated with heart, and when you begin to manifest that in practical ways, not in just big mystical or big deal ways, but begin to live your life moment to moment, day to day from those places, the power of co-creativity heightens. And then you've got an ability to really not only help shape uh, what happens in your life, but you can also have a more dynamic uh, influence or contribution to the betterment of others. One of the things I'm really looking at is vibrational accountability. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what I love about heart math and what I find so inspiring is the science is meeting the spirituality yeah. and showing me, ooh, I actually better take responsibility for my emotional footprint. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, in line with that message, what do you think? Um, what do you think it takes for humanity to kind of get on board with this? Well, humanity is changing. You know, what takes what takes sometimes to get humanity on board, unfortunately, at the place we are now is is problems, plain suffering, challenges. You know, when people go through enough challenge and they hit a certain place in their life, then they're willing to look at other options. That's when sometimes change occurs is when people realize that they need to and have to change. You know, there's an easier way and it's the choice. It's the recognition that you can change and not have to go through as much. And that's kind of what I'm trying to help people understand is they don't have to go through the same old paradigms of uh, terms that are, that are to me old and hackneyed, like no pain, no gain. You know what I mean? That's like a paradigm. That's some that's boxing yourself in. You know, I never bought into that. I was like, you mean, really? I can't ever gain unless I feel pain. Uh, I don't think so. I'm going to go this way. Uh, another one would be like, you know, the long, hard path. You know, it's you know, the spiritual growth of deep point. You're, you're going up this long path, climbing this hard hill, this big mountain and all that. Yeah, that's, that's a viewpoint. I prefer to look at it like, let's take the elevator. You know, uh, there's a way to move on now and you can make the shift much quicker than you used to. So, yeah, the long, hard path has been a paradigm around for a long time. And I'm not saying everything is easy, but certain shifts we can make inside ourselves are easier now than ever before. So humanity's getting on to some of that. Now, 
as we go through this this era of high speed change that we are living in, the world's problems are on full display, right? And we see it so much clearly now, especially through all the input we get through media, social media, et cetera. We can see so much more. And I think one of the things that's, that's happening and going to happen is the challenges are going to actually begin to force us to work together. We're not going to have as much choice over that. The individuality or the separation or the not doing it together is going to get harder to pull off, you know, just because of the, of the challenges that we're going to experience as a planet and as a global society. But that's going to force us to um, get real creative and to figure out how that happens. It's interesting. I was watching, a, you know, I was reading an article in National Geographic about mass migration. And it was about the guy wrote the article. I can't remember his name, but he had gone to like, I think, seven years or something and actually went into the migrations in various parts of the world and just sort of became one of them and experienced what their world was like. And one of the things he pointed out in the article was that the people, the billion people now that are on the move through mass migration, a billion people are in mass migration right now on our planet. One in seven. He said that they were going to actually be the innovators of the future. He said they look like the total downtrodden now. They look like the bottom of everything right now. And he said, but the spirit and resilience that these people manifest to make this thing work is actually bringing about a whole nother level of creativity. And that they were not only going to make it through this, they were going to actually be major contributors to what came next and to the new. So a total spin, total different spin on these poor migrants that know they weren't quite that way. They were really super resilient and they were super creative because they had to be to survive. Now, I think we're going through some of that as a global society, and that may be what it takes to, to get on to it. But there's also another thing that's happening too, Chris, and that as each of us begins to come into our own understanding of ourselves and our own connection to our heart's intelligence, et cetera, it puts out an energy through the field that, that, that somehow makes it easier for others to get on to it. So despite the world's problems, I see a major movement of positive change that's happening everywhere in the world. Now, the term that, that I use for it is called the ad heart movement. The qualities of heart, however you want to characterize those, but the general qualities of the heart being added into how people are functioning in life. And groups and organizations and people are coming together all around the world and supporting one another for positive change and positive causes. There are so many people that are making turnarounds in their life that are you know, changing their values, changing what they want, changing all of that. It's happening every place I go, everywhere. And I see it uh, as a movement, an unconscious movement in some ways, an energetic movement that manifests itself in different things, like I mentioned, different causes or whatever. But the bigger movement is really a movement of new consciousness infusing itself into humanity and people getting onto that. And as each of us gets onto that and then does something with it, not just sees it as philosophy, but manifests it, it puts out an energy and then un in unseen ways, in ways that I can't begin to, to prove or describe scientifically, it influences other people that make similar choices. And I've had this realization since I was young that whatever I did in life, and I've had a great life, and I'm honored and blessed to have what I have and to have an opportunity right now, for example, to be here with you being filmed for this movie. But a long time ago, I realized that the most important contribution I would ever make in life were the changes I made in myself. And that in and of itself was the highest form of service. If it brought me something great, if I ended up being an author or you know, a part of an amazing organization like HeartMath and a spokesperson speaker thing and all that, that, that all came as, a, as, as gifts. But the bigger service and the bigger service till I'm not here will always remain the changes that I make in myself. That is the real true service because it has such an energetic influence that goes beyond what I can see. But my belief is that, you know, my changes are going to make it easier for others. I totally resonate with that message and giving me goosies because <laughs> to me, as a, as a recovering addict, yeah. my life hinges. It depends on being of service every day. Mm -hmm. That's how I live my life. I wake up and pray and say, look, I give you this day and in return, yeah. you know, I ask for a sober day. And, <clears throat> you know, to me, it's, it's really I get that 24 hour reprieve and it's proved mm -hmm. successful. As long as I keep being of service to other uh, front and center. You've done great with that. And, and you've reshaped your life. You've recreated a new and different world for yourself. In conversing with you right now, I can say that there's even more coming for you. There's still vibration in there of the, of the 
the pain and the struggle that you went through, maybe, you know, you know, the fear of it coming back or at least all these things that can be existing in you still. And there, there's another level beyond that uh, that will be there for you in terms of your fulfillment where you can just even write that stuff off and go, yeah, that was that and move on. You know, and then you don't even see yourself in that same mirror anymore and see yourself as a completely different person and see yourself as like, there was two people, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. I love that. And I, I think how well can we be? I want to keep going you know, up and up and up, so to speak. Yeah, you will. Well, this idea of evolving through crisis, I again sort of equate to addiction because maybe we're doing collectively what an addict might do, you know, when they hit mm -hmm. a rock bottom sure. and go, right, that's it, enough. I have to come up, I have to come up with a different way to live. That's right. Well, that's true. And it doesn't necessarily, I mean, addiction is one form of that, you know, and, and that's true. Most people that I've talked to that have been through addiction recovery have reached some point in where it just crisis out on them. And some get there and still don't do anything, right? And the crisis continues and continues and continues. And even no man of crisis gets them to change, right? And that can happen too. But I think, you know, addiction is just one form of that. But there's all kinds of crises that are happening in the world today. And sometimes people have to get to a certain place in themselves when they're willing to look at something new. Um, I think one of the things that will create real change in people, if unfortunately, is, it would be as if there's a money crisis. Money controls the planet. You know, as Doc Chaudhry, founder of Heartmath, says, the Lord Dollar runs the show, right? You know, and uh, and when the money starts getting funky, then people suddenly they lose a certain security that they have and they realize they've got to do something different, right? So a lot of times, as long as they got everything they want, all the externals are sort of being fulfilled, they can sort of get by even with the unhappiness that they feel, the lack of satisfaction that they feel with all that. And that security is not there, then a deeper look often takes place. Now, I'm not wanting that for people. I'm about not having human suffering. I'm just looking at what could trigger more mass change. And it would be something like the monetary system going through a big shakeup that could cause that, you know. Certainly, I think we look and say the changes occurring um, in climate change are already starting to, to cause that. And there's two reasons for migration, for example. One is climate change, the other is war, right? But climate change is causing migration. The migration is causing problems. Those problems have to be dealt with, so the solutions eventually have to be figured out how you're going to deal with that. So it may start with a climate issue. It ends up with another type of issue, but in the end result, it could come to some interesting resolutions of how we work together. My belief is, is we're in the right, we're moving in the right direction. You know, uh, the energetic trend, so to speak, is moving up and it's going up and down and wobbling, you know, as we go through various crises of different kinds. And if we look at it only through the crisis that we see, the picture that we're painting through our emotions is going to be a picture that has that, that gray, black, and despair in it. And I know people that just say like, the world is, is blowing up. It's not going to get better. I don't see that at all. I see that these are creating choice points for us. And we as a global society, such a resilient species that we are, the human being, is making choices that are moving us in the right direction. Energetic momentum is going this way. And that... Uh, it will take a little more time and we're going to go through some tough road as we go that direction. But ultimately, we are going to have a new and very different world, unlike anything we can possibly imagine or much less ever see before. That is happening. And that's my hope. That's my belief. That's what I want a viewer that's watching your movie right now to hear. Uh, let's go into the higher realms of the fourth dimension. Okay. You talk about a new human. Are we on the verge of a spiritual awakening? Yeah, we're definitely on the verge of a spiritual awakening. It's happening. Not on the verge of it. We're in the middle of it. You know, that's what's interesting about it is that, you know, we keep waiting for something to happen and it's happening all around us. <laughs> and that's the fun part. It's like it is happening right now. We're living in a time period where that spiritual awakening is unfolding in people. You got to look at it this way. Everything takes time and progresses. You look at it practically. You know, it's not going to be about a big bang thing where all of a sudden everybody has this big spiritual involvement and awakening. It's a stepping stone process. It's built that way. It has to be that way. Uh, you People and the planet could not take that much change that quickly. It has to be integrated in in a very balanced kind of way. And that's happening, and it has been happening, and it's going to continue to happen, and it's going to actually accelerate. So the, the spiritual awakening that people are waiting for is actually taking place right now, but it hasn't had necessarily the glamorous big bang kind of a, of a context to it. So sometimes it gets unnoticed. In terms of a galactic evolution or you know a mm -hmm. shift to higher realms of consciousness. 
How, what's the science behind that? What, what's HeartMath's kind of experience or take on that? I don't think we have science or anybody really has science on the cosmic side of it or the, the consciousness field side of it. I think the scientists that we have, Roland McCready and others that are working on this sort of thing, I think their ultimate really, really big picture goal is to prove the existence of spirit and how it merges with humanness. You know, but there's a big, you know, a big uh, leap to be made there. Now, there are some brilliant scientists in the world today that are working on understanding consciousness in new and different ways. And I think all that has got to be respected and honored. I also feel like the science itself is sort of beating itself on a ceiling. It's trying to, to prove the existence of and explain another dimension through the tools of this dimension. And so it can only get so far and then it runs into the ceiling, right? So what's it going to take to move through that ceiling? Well, it's going to take a breakthrough in the internal consciousness of the people who are actually doing the research. It's through that insight. It's always been that way. I mean, the greatest inventions and all really came in many ways from an unfoldment of the individual who was having that, those insights. They often were accidents. Some of the greatest achievements and in, in, um, inventions of the world were not even what was being looked at. There was something else going on and the intention was different. A great example, that's the microwave. You know, uh, there was a guy named Percy Spencer working for the Rayathon Corporation back in the 1940s. He was a low level scientist. He was testing tubes for radios and when these radios had tubes in them. He laid a candy bar down on the table and he went to the, use the, the, the loo. He came back and his candy bar was melted. He looked around and he couldn't figure out why. There was no heat. And so he had an insight. He could have, at that point, he had a choice. He could have said, I'm mad my candy bar melted and gone about his business. But he said, well, I gotta figure out why this candy bar melted. So he wondered if the tube had anything to do with it. So he went in and got in, a, he got uh, some popcorn and he put it down next to the tube and the popcorn popped and he was onto something. And the tube was radiating something. So it, that became the invention of the microwave. Percy Spencer wasn't trying to invent a microwave. He was trying to test a tube. Now that happens a lot in science. And so I think the new discoveries about consciousness will come in many ways through what insights or what intuition pokes itself through and whether we catch that or not, or whether we recognize that or not. And that will come if the people that are involved in that type of research are tuned to that type of frequency and information that can come in. Then we'll begin to understand consciousness a bit more uh, and what it is and all of that. But I think the way we get to there is not looking directly at figuring that out, but looking at how we live our lives day to day. You know, do the work, you know, do what needs to be done to be a better human being. Can I be kinder to others? Can I be less reactive? These question for myself. Can I, you know, um, put out more care? Can I put out more compassion without it draining me through unmanaged empathy? I mean, these are like games I play in my own consciousness. And as, as I do that, I, I'll just wait and see what unfoldment comes, what insights come. Because insights will come, but they'll come almost unknowingly. I mean, you'll get them and, you know, and you know to do something or not do something. And I think that the same is going to be true in terms of where research goes and where science goes. And that's still giving honor and uh, respect and credit for the brilliant scientists that are working on these things, who are pondering these bigger picture uh, understandings and who are doing the real work to try to figure that out. So I say that with great respect if any of you are watching, uh, but I think it's our internal work that's going to get us to the intuitive insights that leads to those type of understandings and breaks us through the ceiling that science is beating its head on right now. Man, I totally agree. And I am surprised in a way that my inquiry or investigation into emotion, sentience, has led me to intuition. Uh, do you think the future of humanity hinges upon our ability to, de to develop these subtle senses? Yeah, I think intuition is something that um, it is going to take to come up with solutions to the challenges and problems that right now seem to have no solutions. But intuition needs to be looked at practically as well. Intuition is a field of information that's there all the time. It exists. Intu we see intuition as something that comes and goes. We get an intuitive insight. Something happened. Intuition showed up. I see it differently. I see it as I finally tagged into the intuitive field. <laughs> it's around me. It's there all the time. I go in and out of contact with it. It doesn't go out of, in and out of contact with me. The way we look at it at HeartMath is we look at it through the lens of, of what we call practical intuition. In other words, we want intuition to not just be seen as mystical or as brilliant blast of insight, the next invention, the next discovery, uh, all of that. We want it to be seen as a practical intelligence that we can use to navigate life. Now, when I begin to look at intuition through that lens, I see it everywhere. I see how intuitive things are. I'll give you one example. 
I'm not a parent, but I observe people who are parenting. And I'll go, that's one of the most intuitive things I've ever seen in my life. How is that parent tagging in to that child to understand that child's needs, especially when they're really young and they can't even communicate what they need? And the mother or the father is, is constantly in this sensing mode with this child, trying to understand that there's a, a communication and an information exchange happening. It's not just through words or through that. They're observing behavior. They're observing body language. They're tuning in. They're sensing. And it becomes very naturally practical, intuitive process that occurs. And when I look at that, I'll say, well, how is that, that intuition being accessed? And it becomes a simple observation to me. It's accessed because of the love being exchanged by the parent and the child, which then leads me back to saying, if you want more intuition, put out more love. <laughs> then intuition shows up more naturally. But intuition it can be very practical, like determining when it's time to have a certain conversation or not. And if you do have that conversation, let intuition guide the words you're using to communicate to get the communication done in the best way possible or get the best result out of that communication. That's an example. As a business person, another one that I see is in hiring people. In the United States, in a hiring process, there are laws that don't allow us to ask personal information. So we can't ask someone um, how many children they have or you know, do they have any health issues or you know, all that. We can ask questions about their resume or sort of leading questions about their job in the past and how they handle the situation, whatever. But the personal questions, we can't ask them. And I found that very unusual, but that's true. That's, and so when I go into, when I'm brought in now to, to participate in a job interview, I've already been instructed, don't ask them that. You know? So I look at resumes and I can see there's equality in the resume and I can talk to the person, they can lay out all the skills and, and all that. And eventually I have to make a decision. I'm involved in this right now. And so at some point, my intuition has to kick in and I have to get a feeling. Is this person going to fit our culture? Is this person going to enjoy being here? Which is a consideration I have in hiring anyone. Not just will they do the job. You know, that's a consideration as well. But are they going to fit? Are they going to like it here? Are we going to enjoy being around them? Is my team that they're working with going to you know, integrate well with this person and them with the team and all that. Those are intuitive decisions I have to make. I can't find that from a resume. I can't get that from asking questions. I have to sense that. Well, that's practical intuition. Intuition demystified into the, the sensing that you have when you do that. So I think intuition is becoming more practical and intuition is on the rise. And whereas the access to the field that I call and people call intuition is becoming more readily available. Intuition has moved closer to us, in other words, and we can access it more. It requires a slowing down of the mind. Uh, it requires not relying only upon logical linear intelligence to make choices and decisions, even though that is important as well. It requires a more heart focused approach, I think, of the slowing down of the racing mind and the chaos and the confusion of tuning with your own heart and the sensing that comes from that. Uh, when I have to make decisions, I use logical linear intelligence. I want the facts. I want all the data. I want all the information. And then I also want that second opinion. And that's my heart. And then from that, I'll put together whatever I have there and make that choice. A uh, consultant that I worked with for a while I used to use the term informed intuition, meaning both sides of that equation. So intuition is practical and you can have more of it. And then when you do, then you'll start seeing that there are all these little magic moments, so to speak, or these little synchronicities and things that people identify with that are part of that gift too. It isn't all just dry. There's interesting things that just show up and flows that happen in life and all that becomes uh, different when we're in more intuitive contact. Intuition can lead to more flow to where you're sort of flowing through life of less rough edges and corners, you know, and even when things are not matching your expectation or what you want, there's a, a lift that you feel in that. Like, so what? Big deal. You can find it up in that. You can make it fun. You can make it funny, you know, at times when things are there. That has a lot to do with uh, the connection we're having to our heart and to the intuitive intelligence that comes with heart. Just to follow on on a few things you just said. First off, I do think the bales are thinning um, in terms of, you know, these intuitive, um, guidance systems mm -hmm. becoming more available to us, more accessible. Yeah. Um, if I follow that rabbit further down the hole and you touched on this as well, it's like, is my heart, my connector to my highest self? And then ultimately the great cosmic intelligence, 
Here's my belief. I believe that the heart is the entry point within the human system for higher intelligence, for the access of information that we call consciousness or spirit or, you know, a lot of names for that. I'll just call it the universal source. The heart's the entry point. It's a receptor of that type of higher dimensional information. It comes into us through the heart. It's transmitted at super high speed. It's experienced in thoughts and feelings and maybe visual things and things like that. So the brain gets the credit for it. But where was the impetus? Where did that come in? My belief and my personal experience is it comes in through the heart. It will come in through the heart when I'm in touch with that part of myself, when I'm operating back again to emotion from those higher heart qualities. That's when it happens. I don't have those type of experiences when I'm judging somebody or when I'm mad. I have those type of experiences when I'm in much more of a heartful place and it doesn't have to be squishy or sentimental or whatever, but that just genuine quality of good old solid heart manifesting my own sense of dignity and nobility, which are heart qualities. When I'm in that place, then I get access to more of what we call universal source. Heart is the entry point where intuition and higher dimensional consciousness interfaces with our humanness. That's essentially where I've landed with my own personal definition of sentience. So that leads me nicely into that realm. It's kind of this beautiful place, in my opinion, where the arts meet science, meet spirituality, Mm -hmm. you know, meet consciousness, meet et cetera, et cetera. Um, And it might be different for everybody. What's your own definition of sentience? So the context of how does all this fit into sentience? Sentience in, I think, the context of which your movie is, 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 uh, is talking about it is self-awareness. Yeah. What does self-awareness mean? Well, it means a lot of things. Like, are you aware of what you're feeling right now? <laughs> are you tuned to the emotions that you're really feeling? Are emotions just something that are just sort of flying around and you're not really paying attention to them? You know, that's one way of looking at it. And I'll expand upon that just a little To me, there's a river of emotion constantly running through every waking moment or every single day. And we occasionally become aware of it. Usually it's when the emotions become strong and then we sense them like we're really happy or we're really mad and we do that. But that river's flowing underneath all of our perceptions all the time. The term that I have for it is is not subconscious emotions, but I call them subtly conscious emotions. I want to get into a little bit sentience being a guidance system Mm -hmm. or an informant of the soul um i mean you kind of you really covered that i don't know if you to me i kind of coin it as the language of the light i don't know what jives with you yeah Yeah. light in terms of consciousness being light etc and our feelings are that constant interface with our higher self trying to give us messages yeah yeah there's all kinds of of messages that come to us from our real self. And I'm not saying they're all, all outside our self. There's, I think we're multiple selves, you know. I mean, proof of that, my sense of it is that we are. And there's all kinds of information trying to come from our multiple selves. Um, we could call it our larger self or our large. We could even just call it our large. Is always trying to communicate with us and give us guidance. But it's not necessarily going to be the type of guidance that pleases the personality. And so when the personality is not getting its way, it generally tends to shut down what the large is trying to help us with, the guidance that is coming. To me, that larger self is moving closer now into our humanness is sitting on our shoulder. So the voice of the large is getting louder for many of us. It's getting harder to ignore. Um, as we be- become more self-secure, as we go through our maturing process, and we learn to trust that more, even though it doesn't please the personality in that time frame or that moment, recognizing that ultimately it's going to take us to a much, much better place. I've seen that in my life so many different times, and yet it's still hard sometimes to accept what I'm, what I'm the sensing or the message that I'm getting, even though I've seen it play out that way my entire adult life, uh, because the personality wants to hold on to a lot. You know, it wants to hold on to certain identities or certain things that it thinks is going to be fulfilling and all that. I understand that as part of being a person, as part of the evolutionary process, not bad, you know, not bad or good. But the guidance system that's coming from our large into the human system right now is becoming stronger. That is part of evolution. That's part of the evolution of us as human beings, evolution of the new human, so to speak. It's happening is more that higher intelligent integration into us, the humans. And that manifests itself in ways where we begin to, to understand how to make better choices to figure out life. Are we activating more strands of DNA? 
some scientists believe there's all kinds of changes happening in DNA. I, it's not my my field of expertise. You know, I know scientists that say that that we're really activating all kinds of new DNA potentials. That that's part of what's evolving is the DNA is actually changing. That's pretty exciting to me. That can inform things like our physi physiology for one thing. All the changes could occur in our body, lifespans and cures to disease that come from the inside out, and lots of great potentials there. Again, there's brilliant people that know more about that than me. Uh, I'm pretty much a pragmatist is just trying to, you know, help people understand how to better, you know, get fulfillment out of their life. And then I think in doing so, it leads to things like changes in their DNA. But um, you probably interviewed some of those guys that have talked about that. And so I'll leave it to them to answer that question. Well, I absolutely love your down to earth, <laughs> uh, you know, view of matters of the heart yeah. and subtle senses and emotion and beyond, really. Sure, yeah. 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 And on that note, what are some practical ways I can actually get in touch with my large? One of the first things people need to do to get in touch with their larger self is to actually appreciate what they already have. You know, appreciation of anything, appreciation of the moment is like a, it opens up for downloads into humanness. It's like a window, a portal, so to speak, that opens up much more when you're pre when we're in appreciative mode. The wide angle lens begins to take place. I know it sounds, yeah, yeah, I've heard all that and throw back gratitude and appreciation. And we have, and I respect what's being what has been said and how people have applied those those principles. But there's more to come, more to unfold. As we evolve as and as the world evolves and as consciousness evolves, things that we've known about before take on even new power and new meaning. Appreciation would be a great example of that appreciation this magnetic energy that draws back to us information and things that will be fulfilling that we can extend beyond just appreciating when life goes our way and use it as a tool a co-creative tool would be a great door opener for more large merging with yourself you know that's one i would say another is um life works best when we're giving more to it than we're trying to take from it so putting more out into the world, looking out for the well-being of others is going to bring more of your own large in. Large is going to support that. Large is going to support that kind of activity. It's going to help you, give you more information about, you know, a lot of things if you're really trying to make that type of contribution. Um, the other thing about bringing more large in, the practical thing people can do is, is to... Um, be open to new possibilities. We tend to put boxes around ourselves, you know, and, and the older we get, the more the boxes harden, you know, and they become stronger. This is the way this is. This is the way that is. A term at heart math would be too many, you know what you knows, you know, it's this way, it's that way, they're this way, they're that way. So challenge your own, know what you knows, and that allows more of your large to come in, more of your spirit to show up because it's got all kinds of new possibilities, but it can't really inform you if you've already got all the know what you knows around what's possible. You know, that's boxing it in. That's saying, well, large is going, well, I need to try to talk to that. They already they boxed it in and it's not going to make much of a difference because of the know what you know box that's built around something. That's a challenge for me. It's a challenge for everybody, you know, to challenge myself in that way, to move beyond. Uh, certain perceptions that may be limiting. Maybe that's what we're deconstructing. I think we are deconstructing some of the box that we put around consciousness, our self, our worldviews, our self-views. I think deconstructing that leads to greater sentience. So moving out of the box that we know what we know is, is the deconstruction process that leads to the new leads to integration of more spirit in our humanness, leads to more intuitive capacities and more ability to co-create the life we want in the world we want. Do you think sometimes we can be our own worst enemy? Yeah, if we can look at it through that lens, we certainly are. We are, we often get in our own way, but yeah, you know, that's again, part of the deal. It's not, um, let me answer this differently. Yeah, sometimes we, we are our own worst enemy, but it's not our larger self that's our worst enemy, it's the assumed self that is. What do you mean by assumed self? We make assumptions about who we are. We pattern ourselves around what we see in society. We pattern around ourselves of where we, of how we were raised, or where we lived, or all these different things, or what country we were from. And then we want to fit into wherever we are, so we assume parts of our own identity to make ourselves a, appropriate for that situation or for others. And we try to please others. We're told what we'll be. Society tells us what we need to be. And in the context of that, we develop this thing called a personality or a persona, and 
some of it's real and some of it's actually a facade, you know. And unfortunately, the way it works is that we spend a lot of our time trying to defend something that's not even really us. We try to defend the facade. And when the facade is challenged, we go through reactions, vanity reactions about this. And I'm that, and you said I'm not, and I have a vanity reaction to that. There's a deeper self that isn't any of that. You know, and that's where spirits merging with humanness is in that deeper self. Um, that's the real, real us, but it's hard to get to that. I mean, this is an unraveling of things, a deconstruction, you know, around that of our personality and where we're trying to get to, you know. And uh, it was for that reason, among others, but a central reason why I left my career as a, as a rock musician to pursue spiritual growth is I recognized that whatever I thought I'd become was really based on a set of assumptions and a base that I was constantly trying to defend, you know, based on personas that were standard within the context of what I did for a living that I needed to try to portray that were blocking me from some much larger in my life. And it took a lot to be willing to let that go. But I'm glad I did. So am I. Here I am. Yeah, saving the world. <laughs> yeah, working on it. Yeah. It's a lot on your shoulders there at HeartMath. Yeah, there's a there's a lot we do. So, you know, we, we find our regeneration and resilience in it through the inner work that we do. But yeah, so it's a lot to carry. It's a complex system, complex business. Uh, we're dealing with lots of different things all all at the same time. Multiple markets, different things in which we ways in which we share heart heart, heart whether through training programs or through technology and all this other stuff. And um, and we work hard. And it's a 24-7 kind of existence that we have. But it's not like someone working a job that they hate that they have to work that much. It's, it's a labor of love that we have. The regeneration that we need to carry that load comes from doing the work that we do on the inside from continually trying to evolve our own heart's intelligence and taking those steps and putting some time into that as well. Never losing sight of that, no matter what the busyness brings us. can never use that as an excuse not to be trying to manifest the real qualities of what I want to be as a human being. And so, yeah, I'll be better at that some days than others. But at the core of it, it always has to come back to that. There's the evolution of me, again, as I said earlier in our time together, of the changes I'm making myself is the real service. What I do in heart math, what I do in a business is important, but not more important than the changes I'm making in me. It all goes back to you. Yeah. Do you think, in a sense, you are the universe? As a microcosm of the macrocosm? I think I'm from a higher dimensional system, the sewer system. <laughs> I don't know about all that, if I'm, you know, all that stuff. I guess I am. I mean, there's, these are all con conceptual frameworks that, that, that can have an interesting intrigue to them. But yeah. I can only focus on what I can, you know, know and think I can actually pull off and do. And that's where I try to keep my focus, you know. But people can have choice to play in all kind of arenas. I'm not down on any of that, right? Yeah, sometimes I think it makes it fun, bring some magic into it. Sometimes. Absolutely. You know, you got to have fun in the whole process. I mean, it's uh, fun and manifest in different ways. It isn't just about the, the, the external joy all the time. There's an inner fun that comes from knowing you did something, you did it well, you did it right, you know, and there's a lift that comes from that. But I think that, you know, one of the things that I have been able to, ma to maintain as I move through all this over time is a sense of humor. So yeah. <laughs> it's part of my style, part of what I'm known for, part of what I contribute, you know, to the organization of HeartMath. Much to this may of others at times, but yeah, that's what I do, you know. <laughs> I think it's fabulous. <laughs> and it's a sign of psychological health. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, that's I good. think so. Clinically speaking, <laughs> um, well, well, we can sort of start to bring it to a close. Right. Um, I wanted to go back for a second on mm -hmm. what you said ab about heart math and really doing the work mm -hmm. as an organization. Do you think that we will see in our lifetime our big corporations operating in that way? I think big business is changing. I think business is going to go through am amazing changes. I would say within the, within the next 10 to 50 years, business as we know it today will not exist in the same way in the not too distant future. It can't. 
it's based upon principles that are dying. It's based upon, I need to get more from you than you're giving to me. It's based upon competition. It's based upon ambition. All of this is part of our world today, but that part of our world is changing right now. There's a new game in town. The rules of the world are changing, and businesses will have to respond to that at certain points in time. I am not a big fan of business as it is today, even though I have to participate in it. I see a future where business will be based on different principles, where we'll operate more from what we're giving rather than what we're taking. Um, I have to ask questions even to business today. I mean, the corporate laws are set up so that we have to produce extra revenue. We have to always be producing more profit in order to be legally doing what we need to do for shareholders. Is that the way it really ought to be? Why do we always need more money? You know, when is enough enough in this whole context? And I think business is going to come to those realizations in the future. And I think businesses will have to become more socially conscious in order to uh, to make it. I mean, there is a, a movement right now in something called purpose-driven marketing, where companies are actually marketing their purpose more than their products, trying to engender customer relations and loyalty. Some of that is really authentic and some of it's disingenuous but the companies are smart enough to know that they got to do that now because it isn't just about price anymore on products they got to create a resonance that uh with customers to maintain customers so these are these are, see what i'm saying the changes are already beginning to happen it becomes it will become more authentic over time but consciousness is changing i wrote about some of that in uh, the chapter that i wrote in the heart intelligence book on social coherence i talked about advertising Look at the advertising you see today showing happy people or showing people caring for one another or doing caring things for one another. Well, guess what? You know, they're doing that to sell products. I get it. But you know what? Before they do a national television ad campaign on something like that, they have tested that up one side and down the other. So what they're testing is a hunger people have for that. To have more people giving and caring and cooperating and all that. So they'll put that in their ads because they figured out that's what people will respond to. So the good news in that is even if they're selling products, they've tagged into a hunger humanity already has. So business will continue to respond to that hunger and it will go through changes. And the old competitive models are not going to work further down the road. They just simply won't be able to work. In terms of generating what I'm calling super coherence, like mass meditations, right? Yeah. So you're yeah. gener generating that higher level of coherence. Mm -hmm. Do you think our, again, the future of humanity kind of hinges on our ability to do that? I think all that's contributing right now, and it's important. It's stabilizing a lot of things. There are a lot of things that are helping to influence the consciousness shift. And anytime people come together and, and for the right, for good reasons, for good intention like that, and join forces is an amplification that does occur. So there's benefit that comes from that. I think it plays a role and plays a part, but there, there's external influences that are helping. There's influences coming from the animal world, and you know, you know all that goes that, you know, they're helping to stabilize this thing and get, get us through you know, our planet and us through this transitional time. Um, so getting together and doing these mass meditations and things like that, I think are all contributors. I hope that they we continue to be done. I hope there'll be more of them. And I think that they play a part and a role uh, in all of that as we move forward in society. I think what we also need to realize, though, is that all that's helping and we need to do that because we, what we're, the point we're in now is we've already done enough to move past apocalyptic scenarios. The influence that we have now, in my view, is on two things. Because the new world is going to happen whether we like it or not. It's, it's coming and it's part of a bigger evolutionary curve. We're along for the ride in certain ways. The two things that we have influence over are how long it takes and how gentle a ride it is. And that's where these meditations come in to help accelerate the time frame, shorten the time it takes to get there, and to make it uh, a, a more gentle ride. Uh, for all of us that are going through life right now. I spoke to an intuitive who channels who said, we already made it. We've, we've, you know, achieved ascension. We're just dreaming our way how we got there. Yeah. In certain ways, the future's already been determined. You know, it's like we're along for the ride, you know, through this thing. And that's good news, really. You know, it's, uh, uh, I mean, I think that the planet could have already been taken out based upon the density and all that. But then it's, Grace was offered and we did enough and we've moved past some of that now to where we're at a place where we're 
we're going through a process and reshaping and, and not going to have to go into an apocalyptic scenario where everything goes away. So I think we passed that point. So I have, no, I have no fear of that now. You know, it's like it's moving the right direction. Well, that's good news. Yeah. I mean, you know, so many of us are worried about our carbon footprint, mm -hmm. um, you know, the ecological crisis, the environmental crisis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But do you think our emotional footprint is really the thing that matters most? Interesting question. I think all the footprints that people look at are important, but certainly the emotional footprint is something most people never look at. But the planetary emotional footprint is extremely important. I'll use, I'll give you one example of that. Uh, one of the things that we tend to experience and put into our footprint as a global species is judgment. We judge like crazy. We've gotten really good at it. We can really slice and dice and put people in situations and anything in their place and make it good and bad and right and wrong. And we're experts at judgment. The cumulative judgments is like you could, if you could see it energetically on the emotional footprint, it's like a cloud surrounding the planet that's blocking off more. You call it facilitation, you call it light, whatever you want to call it. But the, in those type of influence are being buffered by the, the field of judgment that's being generated each and every day you know, through all the ways in which we've become so skilled at judging, you know. So yeah, that's an example of an emotional footprint. If you, you you can see the carbon footprint, you know, you can see all the pollution in the air. Or if you could see the judgments in the air, it would be a pretty polluted looking. Uh, yeah, uh, and atmosphere. I sometimes wonder, you know, if the two aren't interrelated, as everything is. Well, they are definitely related. You know, the external of what we're putting in to the energetic field is having a big impact over what happens to climate, for example. You know, there's there's a direct correlation between all that unproven at this point, but that's something that I believe, I've always believed that actually, is that we are influencing all that through what we do as human beings. So looking at, you know, uh, the consciousness atmosphere uh, is important to consider. Uh, a term I used when Doc and I used, wrote the Heart Mass Solution book was the consciousness climate, which really is all about the emotions that we're putting into the climate, into that field all the thoughts and feelings and emotions that we're generating as a global society each and every day, you know? And so I'll offer some good news about that though, is that more coherent emotional states like more love, care, compassion, compassionate latitude, those kind of emotions are more actually potent than the strong, than the negative ones, all the normal judgments and the frustrations and all that. They're more focused. They have more power in them. So you can, Use those type of emotions to burn off the cloud of judgments. It's like sunshine burning through a cloud. You put out more love into the field, it burns off a bunch of that density that's being created through the normal you know, human emotional response patterns. And so we have an ability to cut through a lot of that density through putting out the other kind of emotions. So we feed the field, we feed the consciousness climate, and we do leave a footprint. And I guess something else that you coined I noticed in your workshop was the inner weather report. Yeah, the inner weather report's a, a term we use for one of the exercises that we do. You now, sometimes in a corporate setting, we call it depletion to renewal or whatever, but it's like a grid where you have, you know, emotions in each quadrant and you begin to look at those. Some of those emotions are more energized than others. Some of them are regenerative, some of them are not. And you begin to get a sense and a map of the emotions that you experience on a regular basis. And you look at it as a weather report, which is, provides a, a bit of sense of objectivity to what you feel. Not so heavy, not such a big deal. You know, well, yeah, it's a little rainy up here right now. You know, or certainly it's a, a different kind of weather over here. I think I'll go over there. You know, so it's that kind of exercise. And you can look at all the emotions that we are feeling every day as an inner weather report. What's the emotional weather report of the planet today? Yeah. And you could actually, you know, see it as weather, you know, it's in what's in the air. What's, what's that, you know, that we're all feeling today. Like an, like a bigger picture of the, of the inner weather report that we do in an individual context. I love it. Brilliant. It's a great visual. Thank you so much. A very intriguing conversation with Howard Martin from heart math. Do you have anything else to add? Yeah. Um, no matter what, you know, as you go through life and a lot of things to figure out, a lot of complexity, whatever. But one thing I want everybody to consider and remember is that as we all go through this process, to please have compassion for yourself. You know, there are going to be times when you don't feel like you're good enough, times when you don't feel like you understand things or that you haven't done enough or whatever. 
uh, when you get to those places, recognize you're a good person doing the very best you can during an interesting and sometimes challenging you know, era in human history. And have that little talk with yourself, with your own best friend, your heart, and say, it's really okay. You know, and just have that self-compassion. Give yourself the gift the heart's trying to give you, and don't let the unmanaged mind rob you of it. Take the gift of self-compassion, pick up and move on. That's what I like people to remember. Maybe that's something else for deconstructing the unmanaged mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much, Howard. My pleasure. <laughs> cool. That's a wrap.